Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode here on Gwiglet. Today we are continuing on our series on Macbeth. We are looking at Act 2, Scene 2. So, if you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends and others that are studying Macbeth, and tap that bell icon for more books, bids and beyond. And if you haven't already, why not follow Gwiglet across the different platforms we're on Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. It would mean the world to me. Thank you so much. So, with this video and with every video, what can you do with this lesson? Well, first of all, make sure you're taking notes. Use this as a really valuable resource. This particular video goes out to my current year 11 class. And while it's a confusing time for us all, we will get through it. And this video aims to help you get through it. In addition, annotate a copy of the text. Make sure that you have your copy to hand, taking the notes as you go. You should use this as a revision tool with your friends. Share the video, watch it together. What do you pick out that the your friend or your um, classmate may not? Use it for mind maps to help build your understanding of the characters and list examples as well where you can. So today we're looking at Act 2, Scene 2. And just a little reminder, what happens before Act 2, Scene 2? First of all, Macbeth has been deliberating, you know, um, agonising over whether or not to kill King Duncan in Act 2, Scene 1. The famous, is this a dagger I see before me speech, comes just from that very scene. And at the ringing of the bell, at the very end of the scene by Lady Macbeth, we see Macbeth's mentality has changed and he is now clear in his intentions. So I have a video on this on the channel if you'd like to watch it for more. Notice the phrase he says, I go and it is done, the bell invites me. That simplistic language contrasting with the earlier, more floral and descriptive language really shows how the bell and the ringing of the bell has made him switch and his mind has entirely switched as a result. So where we are, Act 2, Scene 2 takes place in the moments that immediately follow Duncan's murder. So we see a real contrast, and pay close attention here, folks, to the real difference in mentality and attitude between Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. The way one is very much torn and tormented over the act that's taken place, and the other is very much, at least outwardly, stoic, calm and resolve, uh, reserved, resolving herself to not be entirely consumed in the way that her partner of greatness is. So here we go, we have the copy in front of us and we will use the same methods we normally do by picking apart the quotes and scenes. So we begin with Lady Macbeth talking about that which hath made them drunk hath made me bold, what have quenched them have given me fire. Remember this takes place in the dead of the night at the end of the party that celebrates King Duncan's forces keeping Scotland and remaining victorious over the rebel forces. Notice carefully here, she uses words like bold and fire. It shows how she's got this sense of confidence. Now, barring the audience, there's no one else here. So we can believe this sense of confidence to be true. Um, she is very much fired up by what has taken place and her involvement in it. However, we also see that while she is very confident, she's also got a little bit of nerves that sort of uh, rise to the surface now and then. Notice Hawk, peace. There's a little bit of a sense here by Shakespeare that she's still nervous and she's still on edge. We notice how she refers to an owl. It was the owl that shrieked. Now, an owl is a common symbol of death and darkness. So it's a very deliberate choice of bird here by Shakespeare. And you can see across the play how he uses a number of different bird references and images to help reinforce the point. She then goes on to say, I have drugged their possets, the guards. I've drugged their drinks of openly admitting her involvement in the plot in the regicide and then we hear Macbeth within the chambers who's there what ho like what's going on they so can't see each other remember it's night time it's deliberately set at night time not only because that makes Duncan more vulnerable but it creates a sense of darkness and confusion within the scene so that theme of darkness is not only literal but metaphorical so it's not just a dark evil act they are committing but there is a sense of of darkness in what is done. Now to continue, Lady Macbeth says, Alack, I'm afraid they have awaked, so she and it is not done. So she is still nervy. Her confidence is slightly falling here. Notice how she's probably quite, you know, amped up and charged up by the fact that she's at the end of a party. She just completed the deed. It's not entirely all there. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I'd done it. Now this is a really revealing line from Lady Macbeth. What she's saying here is there's a shred of humanity in her that she couldn't kill Duncan 
for this sense of him resembling someone that she loves. This is very rarely found. This is a real diamond in the rough here. Please make sure you kind of uh, pay close attention to that particular line. Then, and then Macbeth enters. She refers to my husband. He then begins with the line, I have done the deed, didst thou not hear a noise? So notice he mentions the deed, kind of euphemistic language that disguises the act. He doesn't say the murder, the regicide, I've done the deed. Makes it sound simpler, less threatening and less evil. Then it continues with this flurry of questions. When, as I descended, who lies in the second chamber? And notice just visually how the words have really, really been chopped down here. We have this sense of a much shorter scene and being chopped apart. The range of questions by Macbeth here, along with these short sentences and words, build up this sense of pace and confusion between the two of them. There's this panic, this, this, this panicky energy that comes between the two of them. This is concluded when Macbeth says, this is a sorry sight. And Lady Macbeth contrastingly says, a foolish thought to say a sorry sight. Notice the difference here. Whereas Macbeth is more guilty and regretting, you know, he, he looking at his hands, this idea of what an awful thing he's done. You know, he can't go back now. Duncan is dead. He can't undo the actions he's committed. On the other hand, um, Lady Macbeth is much more of, of a mind of saying how foolish it is. Think a fool like a court jester or a clown telling him to not be so... Um, not be so guilty and not be so racked with guilt, a much more cold, stoic attitude taking place here. Macbeth then continues and comments how there's one did laugh in his sleep and one cried murder. Macbeth is paranoid here and afraid of what has happened, thinking that he may have been caught out by the guards. As the scene continues, he continues to confirm this sense of fear and guilt. They had seen me with these hangman's hands, this idea that, you know, this guilt that could lead him to his death, he feels he has doomed himself at this point in the play. Hangman's hands are a real symbol of that, that he's, these are the hands that will lead him to the gallows, to execution. Lady Macbeth, notice how stoic and kind of indifferent her voice is here. Consider it not so deeply. Even when he says, I could not say amen, he can't complete a prayer. He feels that that has deeply affected him. She, she's very, very dismissive. That simple sentence shows how little his anguish and torment matters to her, and that it is of no great consequence to her. He still continues though and says, I have most need of blessing and our men were stuck in my throat. He's, he can't complete this prayer that he almost feels that not only has he doomed himself to death, but he's also lost his soul. He's lost his Christian faith. He has become cursed. Lady Macbeth, however, is resolute in her sense of dismissal. She says, these deeds must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. She's still dismissive, but however, what's noticed that phrase, it will make us mad, that foreshadows her demise in Act 5, Scene 1. A lot of the things she comments on when she's sleepwalking in Act 5, Scene 1, you know, out damn spot, there's knocking at the gate, they all reference little points within this scene. So there's a real kind of trade-off between Act 2, Scene 2 and Act 5, Scene 1. What she dismisses in Act 2, Scene 2, later becomes manifested into her guilt in Act 5, Scene 1. Macbeth then continues and says, Methought I heard a cry, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep. He's lost this sense of mental peace or calm he may have felt. It's gone. He then carries on with this rambling sense of lines here, the death of each day's life, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. He's lost this sense of peace and tranquility. This list has become rambling has become incoherent and um, he is then shut off and cut off here by Lady Macbeth saying what do you mean she's incredulous she can't understand or recognize her husband's pain at this point she's completely detached from the sense of anguish and torment he clearly feels he continues however and says still it cried sleep no more Macbeth shall sleep no more this idea that he is doomed and she says you do unbend your noble strength to think so brain sickly of things so we get this idea that while he is unbroken and unfixable, she says you, notice the pronoun you, she doesn't share these same fears, at least she doesn't openly yet. She is the one very much in command and in control of the, of the scene we read here. So while he says sleep no more, Macbeth shall sleep no more, she is very much of the, of the mind of him, it's, it's him ruining himself here. Um, and then he, she continues and asks why he brings these daggers from the place. 
he has messed up he's slipped up he should have left the daggers with the grooms we see how this soldier this brutal soldier has now actually committed something that is flawed and could um could criminalize them um in terms of the act itself and when we get onto the final lines of the scene we see how while he's meant to go back to the bedchamber and smear the grooms with blood to frame them he cannot he is afraid to think of what he has done and can't look on it he's completely undone he can't look at bloodshed now this is the same soldier who in act one scene two was a hero who could disembowel and decapitate a man in the name of the king he cannot now even look on his bloody hands she then comments and says how he is infirm of purpose she is openly critical of Macbeth now openly mocking him and what he cannot do she then refers to it as the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil she's comparing him to a child this mocking harsh tone this frustration from Lady Macbeth begins to spill over we can really begin to notice that in what she says here so she goes to do the deed now and while she com commits the deed um, we hear knocking the knocking within this is the idea of the knocking of the door as obviously the door has been locked to help them commit the crime but it foreshadows Lady Macbeth's later demise this knocking in Act 5 scene 1 is a, is a uh, phrase repeated then then Macbeth then goes uh, into the sense of over over set um, excuse me sensory detail sensory overload notice how he comments on his not the noise appall and the noise appalls that the the color of his hands pluck out his eyes he can't look at them he can't wash this blood clean from his hands all this sense of murder and guilt is consuming every sense of his and very much um, fear making him feel doomed however when Lady Macbeth re-enters she comments on how my hands are of your color but I shame to wear a heart so white notice even then her mocking tone is still unchanged this idea of shame and white white meaning like um, cowardice you know, this idea of being a coward and not being man enough in her eyes to commit the act the knocking continues and then she says how a little water clears us of this deed notice this phrase a little water but this act isn't such a big deal um, at least outwardly to Lady Macbeth just a small amount of water can clear this of their deeds um, and can remove the guilt which is at complete odds and contrast to Macbeth's mentality and at the end of this scene it's her in control get on your nightgown be not lost so poorly in your thoughts this use of commands or imperative verbs by lady macbeth demonstrates how she is the character that is very much in control at this point as opposed to macbeth who is taking her lead macbeth ends the scene by being completely wrapped in guilt to know thy deed were best not to know myself wake duncan with thy knocking my wood thou couldst this anguish and guilt by macbeth is completely unchanged he ends the scene completely unbroken in direct contrast to Lady Macbeth's assured commanding approach so thank you as always once again folks for tuning in like share and subscribe if you enjoyed that please get in touch and leave a comment if that was of any uh, help I surely hope it was have a lovely day please don't forget to um, follow us across the uh, various different platforms we're on and until next time the next time excuse me until next time all the very best take care and bye bye